Welcome to Face Toward Zion. For the week of March 2nd through the 8th, the Come Follow Me curriculum covers 2 Nephi 31 to 33, which is titled, This is the Way. This week's cover picture is a diagram that Glenn L. Pace wrote about in his book titled, Spiritual Plateaus. In 1985, Glenn L. Pace was called as a second counselor in the presiding bishopric under Robert D. Hells, who was then the presiding bishop. He served in that calling for seven years, after which he was then called to the first quorum of the Seventy. As a member of the Seventy, he served in various callings, including the Sunday School General Presidency and the Young Men General Presidency. In 1991, he wrote a book called Spiritual Plateaus. In the book, he explained that there are often three spiritual plateaus, which are testimony, sanctification, and spiritual graduate school. This is a, his model of the way. We will discuss this in more detail. For this week, we only cover three chapters, 2 Nephi 31 through 33. This will give us more time to go into greater depth. I will spend most of the time in 2 Nephi chapter 31, which can be titled as Nephi's Testimony or the Doctrine of Christ. Chapter 32 could be Nephi's Prophecy Conclusion or have, You Have to Do Your Part. And finally, the last chapter in 2 Nephi is Catch the Vision, or Another Witness of Jesus Christ. When you start reading 2 Nephi 31, one thing that you'll notice is the number of times the chapter references not only Jesus Christ, but also the Father and the Holy Ghost. President Nelson challenged the women to read the Book of Mormon and to mark references to Christ. In 2 Nephi 31, it would be wise to also mark references to the other members of the Godhead. I just wanted to start out with the first of our Articles of Faith. This is the foundation of, upon which all of our beliefs center. We believe in God the Eternal Father, and in His Son Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost. This chapter will show how they function together as one. In this chapter, Christ is mentioned 25 times, but the Father is also mentioned 13 times, and the Holy Ghost is mentioned 8 times. The eight times the Holy Ghost is mentioned is the most for any chapter in the Book of Mormon. 3rd Nephi chapter 11 and also 3rd Nephi 19 will reference the Holy Ghost six times, and there will be five references in 1st Nephi 10. The only place in scriptures with more references to the Holy Ghost is found in Doctrine and Covenants section 20, where there are nine references to the Holy Ghost. However, Doctrine and Covenants section 20 has 84 verses, which are four times as many as in Nephi, 2nd Nephi 31, which has 21. I find it interesting that in 2 Nephi 31, five of the 21 verses mention all three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. This is almost a quarter of every verse in chapter 31. I will show how this shows the unity of the Godhead. Equally as interesting as how many times the different members of the Godhead are named is the fact that in three verses, the Father himself speaks. How many times in all of scripture do we have words of the Father? Not that many. This means that Nephi had to have been in the Father's presence, or at minimum, Nephi heard his voice and knew it was the Father. I personally think that Nephi was in the Father's presence. Also, Christ speaks in three of the verses. This means that not only is Nephi speaking to us in his calling of a prophet, but we have words directly from the Father and from the Son. We probably should pay close attention to these words. As we delve into this chapter, we will learn that a key factor in our conversion is that we are converted by the word of Christ. Then we will learn that we will be exalted by feasting upon the words of Christ. Here in this chapter are their words directly. Let's begin with the end of the chapter instead of the beginning. The final verse in the chapter, verse 21 says, And now behold, my beloved brethren, this is the way. And there is none other way nor name given under heaven whereby man can be saved in the kingdom of God. And now, behold, this is the doctrine of Christ, and the only and true doctrine of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, which is one God without end. Amen. This verse tells us that this chapter will give us the way. But not only does it give us the way, it also gives us the doctrine of Christ. I'm not sure whether the way and the doctrine of Christ are the exact same, but they are clearly intertwined. Remember from last year's studies in the New Testament that Christ told us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Christ is the way. But what exactly is this way? 2 Nephi 31 will give us incredible insights. 
let's look deeper into what it says. I began by quoting the first article of faith. Probably the most quoted is the fourth. We believe that the first principles and ordinances of the gospel are first, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, second, repentance, third, baptism by immersion for the remission of sins, and fourth, the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. Generally, second Nephi 31 follows the same pattern, but then afterwards it adds, and we must endure to the end. So clearly this is the path, but I like how Nephi gives insights into baptism. Verses 4 through 7 say, Wherefore, I would that ye should remember that I have spoken unto you concerning that prophet which the Lord showed unto me, that should baptize the Lamb of God, which should take away the sins of the world. And now, if the Lamb of God, he being holy, should have need to be baptized by water to fulfill all righteousness, O oh then, how much more need have we, being unholy, to be baptized, yea, even by water? And now I would ask of you, my beloved brethren, wherein the Lamb of God did fulfill all righteousness in being baptized by water. Know ye not that he was holy? But notwithstanding he being holy, he showed unto the children of men that, according to the flesh, he humbleth himself before the Father, and witness unto the Father that he would be obedient unto him in keeping his commandments. I would like to make a number of points on this verse. First, Nephi is referring back to his vision of the tree of life. He speaks of the prophet who baptized Christ in 1 Nephi 11.27. It says, And I looked and beheld the Redeemer of the world, and whom my father had spoken. And I also beheld the prophet who should prepare the way before him. And the Lamb of God went forth and was baptized of him. And after he was baptized, I beheld the heavens open, and the Holy Ghost came down out of heaven and abided upon him in the form of a dove. Nephi will refer back to this vision in verses 9, also in chapters 32 verses 1 and 33 and 9. Second point. In verse 5, he says the Lamb of God is holy. He uses the word holy two more times in verse 7. Nephi ends up calling him holy a total of three times. Remember that Isaiah, in his call in Isaiah 6, sees God on his throne, and the seraphim around him call him holy, holy, holy. Also in the book of Revelation, the beasts call out, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. We'll talk more about this. 3. We often think that the purpose of life is to become holy, and we define holy as the absence of sin. Christ was holy and didn't have sin. However, in order to fulfill all righteousness, he was baptized. What righteousness was he filling? Yes, baptism is a cleansing process, but it is more than that. This is the process that you are born into the family of our Father in heaven. When you are born into a family in this life, you have a father and a mother. Each has important roles. This family relationship is important. As a child, you then become an heir. As an heir, you can inherit all that your parents have. When you are born again, you are now born into another family. The baptism process is used to symbolize birth, specifically water, immersion, and blood. This now then enters you into a covenantal relationship. This relationship has to be entered into, even if you are holy. 4. But for Christ and for each one of us, baptism is a symbol that we are humbling ourselves and as a witness that we will be obedient. Christ gave that us that witness. 5. This relationship is now sealed by all members of the Godhead. Nephi includes all the members of the Godhead in this chapter. Each is present. Baptism is completed in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. 6. There are only two ordinances that are sealed by all members of the Godhead, baptism and temple sealing. How important are these two ordinances? The covenant of baptism Baptism is the key for all these blessings. Baptism is truly the gate. Verse 8. Wherefore, after he was baptized with water, the Holy Ghost descended upon him in the form of a dove. After Christ's baptism, the Holy Ghost descended upon him. After we are baptized, the Holy Ghost descends upon us as well. Verse 12. And also the voice of the Son came unto me, saying, he that is baptized in my name, to him will the Father give the Holy Ghost, like unto me. 
Wherefore, follow me and do the things which you have seen me do. Notice the phrase that says, To whom will the Father give the Holy Ghost like unto me? So just like the Holy Ghost descended on Christ, the Holy Ghost will descend on us as well. Just like unto Christ. Now verses 13 and 14. Much in these verses seem to be repeated and they are. To see this, look here at how I have mapped out these verses. They parallel each other exactly. Both verse 13 and verse 14 begin with my beloved brethren. They then reference the Son. Then they both discuss the need for repentance. Remember that repentance is the second principle of the gospel. Then the phrase, witness unto the Father. This is the same phrase that verse 7 used. Baptism is our witness to the Father. And then, following the pattern of verse 7, we indicate that we are willing to take upon us his name and keep the commandments. I think that all of us are willing to be obedient, but we will all fall short. But by being baptized, we now have a covenantal relationship that we can be forgiven. And then both verses mention baptism. After baptism, here is a key. Then we can receive the baptism of fire and of the Holy Ghost, which allows us to speak with the tongue of angels. We often talk about the gift of the Holy Ghost, but we talk do we talk enough about the baptism of fire? What is this? Let's look to verses 19 and 20. Verses 17 and 18 talk about the gate. For the gate by which ye should enter is repentance and baptism by water. Now verses 19 and 20 will show us the way that we have been talking about. Let's read the verses. And now, my beloved brethren, after you have gotten into this straight and narrow path, I would ask if all is done. Behold, I say unto you, Nay. For ye have not come thus far, save it were by the word of Christ, with unshaken faith in him, relying wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save. Wherefore, ye must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope, and a love of God and of all men. Wherefore, if ye shall press forward, feasting upon the word of Christ, and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, ye will have eternal life. As verses 13 and 14 shown on the previous slide, verses 19 and 20 are better when mapped out chiastically. What you see here is my attempt to do so. The purpose of this chiasm, chiasm is to show on the first half the steps you have to take before the gate. The second half of the chiasm are the steps you take after you pass through the gate. These are the same steps or they're expounded upon only in reverse order. Let's look at these steps with the small letters A, B, and C as shown. Small a. We get to the gate of repentance and baptism by the word of Christ. His word has come to us somehow. We may have, it may have been by others, the scriptures, the missionaries, our parents, but his words have spoken to you. Christ has touched your spirit. He did this with his word. His spirit or words have moved us to want to follow him. Somehow we feel that this is the right thing to do. Small b. Once moved, then we have unshaken faith in him. This faith is the first principle. Repentance and baptism will follow. But once we have been moved, then we have to respond. You don't understand everything. You may understand very little, but you feel this is the right way and you trust him. Small c. Then we rely wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save. What are his merits? His merits are the atonement. You trust that the atonement is applicable to you. So then you get baptized and open the gate. But the fact that the gate is open doesn't automatically mean you receive eternal life. For once you have to walk through the gate, after you go through the gate, then you must do three things. The same as before, but in reverse order. Small c prime. Before you had to wholly rely upon his merits. Now you must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ. The atonement provided the power to move forward to the point of being baptized. Once you are baptized, you are pronounced clean, but now you must press forward. If you are clean, then how much more forward can you go? The answer is, our goal is not to be just to the point where we are absent of sin. Our goal is to become like Christ, to develop the same traits he has, to be in a position where we would do as he would do, that we will help his children. 
The word steadfast here means resolutely or dutiful form and unwavering, firmly fixed, immovable. We will press forward to become what Christ wants us to be and we will be firm in this position. Be prime, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men. It's interesting that faith is what brought us to the gate. Now we move forward with hope and a love of God. There is a word that we use for the love of God and of all men. That word is charity. We now have the component of this triad, faith, hope, and charity. This is the triad to place as a foundation of our life. We've heard of this tri we heard of this triad last year when we first studied 1 Corinthians. We will see it again when we get to the book of Moroni. We will see it next year in the Doctrine and Covenants. To us, charity has to mean that it doesn't matter how people treat us, we will treat them with love, with charity. Times will get hard, but we have a hope that it will all work out. And faith, not only a principle of action, but also a principle of power. Having a perfect brightness of hope means we have a revealed knowledge of our worthiness. We know who we are. We become part of Christ's family at baptism. We know who we are. Finally, A prime, feasting upon the word of Christ. We get to the gate by the word of Christ. We define the word as having the Lord touch us with his spirit. It was his word, not the word of someone else. Now we need to feast upon that word. We often define the word of God as the iron rod, remember? The iron rod is the word of God. While we often define the word of God as the scripture or the words of the prophets, both ancient and modern, but the word of God is when he touches us or when he talks to us. This is personal revelation. This is what we must feast on, not to nibble or wait until Thanksgiving, but to feast upon it, to desire it, to pray for it, to understand how it works for you individually and then to obey it. This then is the way. I'd like to talk about two other models of the way, which I hope will illustrate the point about personal revelation. In earlier videos, I mentioned that as a young man, I served in the Chile Concepcion mission. When we were teaching families with young children, we would often give them the sheet that is shown here. We would ask them what it represents. After a little bit, someone would say they look like stairs. We would ask them where the stairs were leading. They would say to a door. We would explain to them that this is a door or a gate. We would read from 2 Nephi 31 that there is a gate to enter heaven, which is called baptism. We would then ask them to read in Mosiah 18. And we would tell them that in the Book of Mormon, there was a prophet named Alma. And this is what he said. And it came to pass that he said unto them, Behold, here are the waters of Mormon, and now, as ye are desirous to come into the fold of God, and to be called his people, and are willing to bear one another burdens that they may be light, yea, and are willing to mourn with those that mourn, yea, and comfort those that stand in need of comfort, and to stand as witnesses of God at all times, and in all things, and in all places, that ye may be in, even until death, that ye may be redeemed of God and be numbered among those at the first resurrection that you may have eternal life. We would ask if they wanted to be in the fold of God. Do they want to be called his people? Are they willing to mourn with those that mourn and comfort those that stand in need of comfort? Are they willing to stand as a witness of God and be numbered with those at the first resurrection and have eternal life? Who would not want to have these blessings? They would almost always say yes. Then we would ask them to read verse 10, which says, I say unto you, if this be the desires of your hearts, what have you against being baptized in the name of the Lord, as a witness before him that ye have entered into a covenant with him, that ye will serve him and keep his commandments, that he may pour out his spirit more abundantly upon you? If they said they wanted to enter through the gate of baptism and receive these blessings, then we would tell them that to get there, they first had to take certain steps. We would explain that we were there to teach them what they needed to know. These steps are the discussions that we would have with them. We would tell them that we would come and teach them, but they had to be willing to take the steps. Then, once they got to the top of the staircase, that we would help them with the ordinance of baptism. In Spanish, we call this diagram las escaleras, meaning the stairs or the steps or the stairway that they need to reach the gate of baptism. This was very effective in showing what they needed to do. But I would often wonder, and occasionally someone would ask us, what was needed after baptism? Even if they didn't ask, we would still teach them about enduring to the end. In my mind, I had another diagram mentally. It was something like this. 
After baptism, then, there are more steps we need to take. For men, they need the priesthood. This is an incredible gift. Then there are blessings of the temple, which include an endowment, and finally a sealing, and a new and everlasting covenant of marriage. And then it's pretty much endure to the end. Sadly, we often think that endure to the end just means not to make a big mistake. Often it means to be faithful with any callings that you may be offered and generally try to serve people. And that is it. Eventually, if you can endure to the end, you will one day die and inherit great blessings. However, if you feast upon the words of Christ contained in the scriptures, there are even greater blessings. Blessings that sometimes we don't understand. In 2 Nephi 31 verses 13 and 14 that we just talked about, they reference the baptism of fire and speaking with the tongue of angels. What does that mean? Why are these not part of this model? I think there should be a different model than that which is shown here. I think the model should should look more like... After temple sealing, I don't think the path is flat. I think that there are more steps and then more steps. On one of these steps is something called the baptism of fire. Scripturally, there are other names, some which mean the same, but others that mean different things. To be sanctified to have your calling and election made sure, to receive the more sure word of prophecy, to receive the second comforter, to be a member of the church of the firstborn. What are these things? Some of these things are synonymous with Zion. This is why you have to have your face towards Zion. We need to be moving towards these things. In other places, I have labeled the different steps of the Escaleras. Sorry, but it's not really my scope to try to explain what all these steps are. Sometimes I see people try to explain these and it's easy to fall into false doctrine. But it's still my testimony that these things are real. I could show you scripturally where each of these things are found. These concepts are also taught in the temple. Often they are symbolic and it's hard to see, but they are there. You need to pray about these things and keep your face towards Zion. Yea, then cometh the baptism of fire and of the Holy Ghost. Besides my model, there is another model from a general authority. This is the model that is given by Glenn L. Pace in his book, Spiritual Plateaus, that I discussed at the beginning of this video. Elder Pace begins his introduction by quoting President Spencer W. Kimball in the April 1979 conference. President Kimball said, This impression weighs upon me that the church is at a point in its growth and maturity when we are at last ready to move forward in a major way. The basic decisions needed for us to move forward as a people must be made by the individual members of the church. The major strides which must, which must be made by the church will follow upon the major strides to be made by us as individuals. We have paused on some plateaus long enough. Let us resume our journey forward and upward. Elder Pace indicated that he thought three of the plateaus that we pause on are testimony, sanctification, and spiritual graduate school. He begins with a testimony, that a testimony takes us out of this world. Most of us stay on this plateau for some time. We may even take the stance from last week's lesson. We may say that all is well in Zion, yea, Zion prospereth all is well. This may be a long plateau, but if we can conduct ourselves in such a way that the Holy Ghost brings about a literal change in us, we begin to progress towards the next plateau, sanctification. I like how he says this is a literal change in us. Have you experienced this literal change? He says, quote, this is a literal metamorphosis of the spirit, unquote. Once this change occurs, Elder Pace says this graduate school includes mysteries, miracles, and signs and their appropriate roles in our spiritual development. There is a difference between delving into mysteries and having mysteries revealed to us." Unquote. This then leads us on to exaltation. In this section, he talks quite a bit about personal revelation. This is what I talked about as feasting upon the word of Christ. Nephi teaches us that once you receive this baptism of fire and of the Holy Ghost, then can ye speak with the tongue of angels and shout praises unto the Holy One of Israel. Chapter 32 will teach us, Do you not remember that I said unto you that after ye have received the Holy Ghost, ye could speak with the tongue of angels? And now, how could you speak with the tongue of angels, save it were by the Holy Ghost? Angels speak by the power of the Holy Ghost, wherefore they speak the words of Christ. 
Wherefore I said unto you, Feast upon the words of Christ, for behold, the words of Christ will tell you all things what ye should do. The Book of Mormon begins with Lehi entering into the presence of God. 1 Nephi chapter 1 verse 8 says, And being thus overcome with the Spirit, he was carried away in a vision, even that he saw the heavens opened, and he thought he saw God sitting upon his throne, surrounded with numberless concourses of angels in the attitude of singing and praising their God. Nephi then sees the vision of the tree of life. He can't tell us the end of what he saw because that was the calling of John the Revelator. In John's vision, chapter 4, he sees four beasts, each of which had six wings and were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Nephi then quotes Isaiah. Isaiah tells of his call. In that call the seraphim have six wings and cry unto another, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, Nephi extends this promise to each of us. Then can ye speak with the tongue of angels. Not, then can the prophets. Not, then can the apostles. Yes, they can, not because of their calling, but because they are incredible people. But Nephi says, so can ye. This means me and this means you. This is your promise. This is your calling. You too can speak with the tongue of angels and shout the praises unto the Holy One of Israel. Remember Jacob who exclaimed, Oh, how great the plan of our God. Remember all of the times I said to tag these verses with the tag Song of Redeeming Love? This concept is throughout the scriptures and I will continue to point it out when we see it. The message of Nephi is that these experiences happen to him, but to liken it to you means that this can happen to you as well. To realize these blessings, you must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and, a, and all men, and finally, to feast upon the words of Christ, to learn how to receive personal revelation and to follow that. I would like to close with the words of Elder Glenn L. Pace in the Saturday morning session of the October 1992 General Conference. In a talk titled Spiritual Revival, Elder Pay said we have to have the spiritual self-confidence to receive the revelation to which you are entitled. I believe this is what is meant by feasting on the words of Christ. When I was young, I was overly dependent on my older sister. For example, I was a fussy eater. And when we went to visit our grandparents, I was constantly faced with being offered food I didn't like. To minimize my embarrassment, when the plate was passed to me, I would turn to my sister and ask, Colleen, do I like this? If it was familiar and she knew I didn't like it, she would say, no, he doesn't like that. I could then say to Grandma, yeah, she's right, Grandma, I don't like it. If it was something we hadn't eaten before, she would say, just a minute and taste it and then tell me if I liked it or not. If she said I didn't like it, no amount of coaxing could get me to eat it. I know it's past time for me to rely on my own taste buds and stop denying myself healthy food just because my sister told me I didn't like it. On a much more serious note, I believe the time has come for all of us to feast on the fruit of our own testimony as opposed to the testimony of another person. The testimony of which I speak is much deeper than knowing the church is true. We need to progress to the point of knowing we are true to the church. We also need to increase our capacity to receive personal revelation. It's one thing to receive a witness that Joseph Smith saw God in Christ. It is quite another to have a spiritual self-confidence in your ability to receive the revelation to which you are entitled.